Thank you, Donald, very much. Um, I'm going to ask you, so be ready. What's your prediction for yield in 2069? <laughs> we won't hold you to it, but it'll be a fun exercise. Um, our next speaker represents the um, peanut shelling industry, um, Mr. Carl Zimmer has served as president and CEO of Premium Peanuts since July 2015. Formed in the fall of 2014 and located in Douglas, Georgia, Premium Peanut is a grower-owned peanut sheller, which in early 2016 completed construction of a $50 million state-of-the-art shelling facility, which is the largest in the world, with a capacity of, of over 300,000 tons annually. It's owned by peanut growers in 30-plus counties throughout Georgia, and the company has grown to close to $200 million in annual revenue in just over two years of operation and recently completed construction of a manufacturing facility to produce peanut oil. Prior to joining P Premium Peanut, Carl spent close to 14 years with a Fortune 500 global manufacturer of copper and aluminum wire and cable products, where his, first, where his last assignment was as Senior Vice President of Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa Global Supply Chain and Europe-Africa Supply. That's a mouthful. These roles were for which he in these roles for which he and his wife lived in Barcelona, Spain, he had general management responsibilities for the $250 million business in Sub-Saharan Africa, in addition to overseeing all manufacturing, engineering, and supply chain for the $2 billion Europe and Africa region, encompassing 12 plants and over 2,000 associates. Carl began his career at General Electric in 1999 after completing six quarters of co-op assignments with the GE aircraft engines, including a six-month assignment in Munich, Germany. He then completed GE's operations management leadership program prior to moving into Sigma-6 black belt role. Mr. Zimmer received his bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from the University of Cincinnati in Ohio and is actively involved in a wide range of activities with the University of Cincinnati and the Boy Scouts of America. Carl is president of the American Peanut Shellers Association and resides in Douglas, Georgia with his wife, Joan. Please welcome Mr. Carl Zimmer. Perfect. All right, well, thank you and good morning. Uh, my day job is, is a premium peanut, but my, my part-time job, if you will, is, is president of the American Peanut Shellers Association. And I think we're doing a lot of neat things to support the future of the industry and to support the potential vision for 50 years from now. Um, I was glad to, to hear Chris and, and Donald's presentations. We, we did not collaborate beforehand, but we're saying many of the same things. Although I would argue that for the peanut industry to be successful for 50 years from now, we have some work to do today. You know, actions are often driven by incentives. You need the right incentives in place to drive the right actions. And value is created by aligning those actions throughout the supply chain. Most of my background is in manufacturing and operations and supply chain. And it's always disconcerting to see how we destroy value when we pass from one element of the supply chain to another. And whether it's peanuts, whether it's agriculture, whether it's mining copper and aluminum, which I did for, for many years. If you don't align the incentives throughout that supply chain, and you don't align the actions throughout it, you're only hurting yourselves as an industry, and you're destroying value. And so part of what I'm going to talk about is a view of the industry today, and how we have some work to do to align our industry, and to align every element of our supply chain in peanuts so that we can survive for 50 years. You know, we heard already, you've, you've heard some of the demands that are being driven by manufacturers. Now, it's not really manufacturers driving it, but, but I don't pretend to speak for consumers or understand the consumer mindset. So in terms of what the consumers are asking from the manufacturers, who are then asking from further upstream in the supply chain, here are some of those things. And, and I don't think this is just manufacturers. You, you can throw regulatory into that. Uh, Donald mentioned that we're a global industry. We are. Um, a lot of these are being driven by uh, global regulations as well. The first is the standard grade for a peanut. If you look at a shelled peanut, it meets APSA grade. It meets USDA and US regulatory limits in terms of aflatoxin. Good luck trying to sell it. All right, there are very, very few customers in the US, and when you go global, it's probably zero, who will take a peanut, a shell peanut, that meets USDA grade, APSA grade with shelling, and 15 ppb on aflatoxin. So regardless of what the paper says, it's not reality. And that reality is only tightening up further. You know, Europe, I think you all know, the limits on aflatoxin are two and four. 
Good luck getting a two and four peanut into Europe. US peanuts are now on special measures in Europe. They're mandating an over 10% reinspection of all peanuts going into Europe. US peanuts are at the same inspection limit going into Europe as India. Think about that. We pride ourselves on a lot of what we do as an industry in terms of growing a great quality product, shelling a great quality product, having good testing and controls in place. That's not being recognized by the world. US peanuts in Europe are at the same level of inspection as peanuts from India. That is only going to continue. A lot of it is driven by risk mitigation. Whether it's in the US the Food Safety Modernization Act or other regulations in the EU or elsewhere, there's additional regulations that are coming on board in terms of security of supply, in terms of food safety, in terms of mitigating the risk. Those will continue. Traceability, Donald mentioned some of this. I agree with him, that's where we're going as an industry. You know, when I joined the industry, it's, well, we can't go back to the farm. It's a commingled product when it gets to the buying point. Well, it's easy to say, but at some point, we're going to be forced to change the thinking on that. When you could take lettuce, my wife was in the produce business for years. When you could take lettuce, not just back to the field, but back to the row in that field. Right, for lettuce. Lettuce is a commingled product when it gets into the plant. All right, it's coming from peanuts. Sustainability, we heard about that. Targeted sourcing. Targeted sourcing, in my mind, is when a manufacturer or a consumer says, well, I want peanuts from Donald Chase's farm because I know he's done A, B, C, D to his farm. I like what he's done. I want his peanuts. Right, these are some of the challenges that I think we're going to have to figure out how to deal with how to confront. Some of them may not be realistic. I would argue several of them are not realistic. But then we need to work to change consumer perceptions or to present another alternative to meet those demands that are being placed on us by regulatory agencies and by consumers. So now let's go upstream one step in the supply chain. So how are shellers dealing with that and how are we evolving to deal with some of that? We have multiple product streams in shelling. To a large degree, the grade that a farmer gets at harvest doesn't mean a whole lot to a sheller. We all do separate types of grading, separate types of analysis, separate types of regrading to get information so that we can group the product together appropriately to meet our customers' demands. Because the current grading system, and I'll get to that in a minute, doesn't, doesn't allow us to do that. So what does that mean? It means a peanut is not a peanut. We're looking at different attributes, we're looking at different varieties, we're looking at different characteristics of that farmer stock and that peanut to try and figure out how to meet our customers' demands. That's only going to continue. Because a lot of times, if we group farmer stock or similar type farmer stock together, we can deal with it. You know, we have lots of tools in the industry to deal with burrowing bug, to deal with aflatoxin, to deal with all these different types of things. But if it's all mixed together, it's near impossible to economically shell it. So now we have to start segregating it more. You see more segregations, you see more testing, you see more regrading. That's all fine, but it's all sub-optimizing the supply chain. It's adding additional costs into the supply chain that is making our product more expensive. Not a good thing for the future. So how do buying points look at this? Well, buying points are driven by processing tons. Most of them today, back to the incentives, back to, back to incentives drive action, they're incented based on processing tons. How many tons did you buy? How many tons did you store? How many tons did you grade? It's about efficiency at harvest. Turn those wagons, turn those trailers, get them back into the field, back to the farmer, so that they're not waiting as they're harvesting. And provide overall good service to their customers, which are the farmers. So as you're starting to see here, what the manufacturers are asking, driven by consumer demand, does not line up with what the shellers are doing. And now you're starting to see it diverge even more, that the buying points are driven by incentives that I would argue are directly contradictory to what shellers need to meet our end customer demand. So now go back one more step in the supply chain, back to the growers, peanut farmers. 
what are they driven by? Maximize the grade. Maximize the payment from USDA or on the USDA pay scale. It doesn't come directly from USDA. But produce the highest grading peanut per that USDA scale. That, by the way, was created 50 years ago, thereabouts. <laughs> hasn't been updated since. In, I mean, there's tweak it every year. But it really hasn't been updated in 50 years. Hopefully 50 years from now it will be updated. It must be updated, right? They're also driven by economic viability. We need farmers to be successful economically. It's not a good time on the farm. Not just for peanuts, but, but, but in agriculture in general for growers throughout the country, right? So I can't blame them, I can't fault them, I do the same thing. I work for growers. They need to maximize that value of the peanut, but the value drives actions. And that value today is defined by a USDA grading and payment scale that's 50 years out of date. So what does that drive? Well, if you look at the supply chain, and you look at a, a farmer stock ton, generally, rough numbers, $400 is already invested in that product by the time it comes out of the ground. $100 then at the buying point, it's cleaning, drying, store, buying, storing, and $100 in shelling, rough numbers. So if we have a peanut supply chain of $600 per farmer stock ton, we're trying to manage that supply chain in the shelling operation, which is the last stage of these three, and it's also the least valuable. How do we drive those incentives back up the supply chain so that we align the whole supply chain so that we meet our end customer demand? Because we have disincentives and we have disconnects throughout that supply chain. You look at splits and LSKs as an example. You know, there's deductions for high levels of splits that a farmer gets. There's deductions or lower payment, lower value that USDA gives for LSKs. So what does that drive? It drives at the buying point, well, don't dry it down as much. Because if you dry it down farther, you're going to create more splits because it's going to hurt my grade, it's going to hurt my value. So what do we do? We potentially put wet peanuts in a farmer stock warehouse, which drives apple propagation. I would much rather that product be dried another point or two. I would much rather more splits be created. But if you put drier, more consistently dried product in that farmer stock warehouse, you're going to reduce your risk of AFLA propagation. The data says, the data proves it. There's the data there. But the incentives aren't there to do it. We look at damage. Once you get to a seg two, you go from 355 basis grade, 355 dollars basis grade, down to 125 dollars basis grade. It's a cliff. So there's lots of incentives to say don't go above 3.5 percent. You know, do you, if you have some that are some ends, some corners that may be high damage, can you dilute them in to a wagon truck from the same field and get a 3.4 percent? Get a 3.3 percent. It's not the right thing to do from consistently ensuring quality throughout the shelling process and then into our customers. Same thing on foreign material. You know, if you, sometimes you can't control it, weather, et cetera. You gotta pick when you have to pick. But sometimes, you know, foreign material's okay. If it speeds that harvesting process, we'll get it out at the buying point, potentially. But it adds costs and risks throughout the supply chain. So I would argue a lot of our incentives throughout the supply chain are not aligned. And so it's driving actions that are counterproductive throughout each step of the supply chain which is reducing our profitability. It's reducing our costs. And as we look to compete with India, remember Europe considers them the same as the US, as we look to compete with India, in Senegal, in China, we need to have the most efficient supply chain. Not just the most efficient growers, not just the best buying points, not just the highest quality shelling plants. We need to have the most efficient supply chain to be able to deliver a quality product and meet those challenges that are coming over the next 50 years. So just to give you a, a couple examples of what this drives, this data is not exact, but, it, but, it, but it's pretty close. So if you look at foreign material, LSK's damage and aflatoxin, and you look at it at harvest, and then you look at it, I call it pre-shelling, if you do regrading, 
you know, prior to when that farmer's talk comes into the shelling plant, what does it look like? Foreign materials typically one and a half times. LSKs are two times. Damage is three times. And aflatoxin is more than three and a half times. This is looking at that farmer's stock at harvest and looking at it then when it comes into the shelling plant. And I would argue because of some of the things I mentioned where we don't have the incentives aligned throughout that supply chain, we're destroying value. We're destroying value. Some of these things you can't control completely. You know, once you harvest farmer stock, it's going to degrade in value over time. But how can we minimize that degradation in value? How can we minimize the creation of LSKs? How can we minimize aflatoxin propagation in storage? It destroys value if we don't do this. Some of it's storage conditions. There's lots of research and work going on on that. We need to continue to drive that. Some of it's inaccurate grading and sampling error both at harvest, but also pre-shelling. No system is perfect. And a lot of it is also handling practices. But the results are real. And the results tell us that we're adding cost and inefficiencies throughout our supply chain. And if we continue to go down this route, we're not going to meet those challenges that are coming in the next 50 years. Because we won't be economically competitive, and we won't be producing quality products. So what can we do, what, ne what should we do, starting today, to prepare ourselves for the future? I would argue we need to reward every level of the supply chain for actions that add end market value. We need to move away from rewarding farmers and growers for actions that deliver a better grade that just creates more difficulty and more cost for the buying points and shellers. We need to value shelled product in a way that's directly linked to what the manufacturers and the consumers would like. And then I think if we get that value scale changed, we can start driving actions that preserve that end market value at every step versus destroying that value. So as you're doing research and as you're looking at opportunities and projects, I think our collective challenge is how do we consider all elements of the supply chain? Don't just look at maximizing yield on the farm, but look how that impacts the sheller. Don't just look at reducing aflatoxin in storage, but then how does that impact the growers and the shellers? How do we consider the entire supply chain as we look at the projects and research we're doing? One of the things that's going on today is we're, gonna, we're trying to improve efficiency in grading. It's a project led by federal state, but USDA, LMC, and Georgia Tech are involved with that. How do we speed up the grading process at harvest? That's a great project, right? We need to move faster with it, and, and we're working on that. But we've also just launched, launched an initiative um, as, as an industry, and we had all elements of the industry in a, in a kickoff meeting here a few weeks ago, in terms of how do we do grading phase two? And grading phase two is not just about new technology. It's not just about doing it faster. You know, the project that federal state's leading is working on that. What we're going to look at is how do we change that whole value scale? How do we potentially change that USDA payment scale? Once again, to align the value back to the farmer, to reward actions, and to drive actions that are gonna allow us to create a better product, higher quality product, at a lower cost. We need your help to do that, though. Peanuts, in many ways, have relied on historical knowledge and have relied on um, a very insulated perspective. We need to broaden that perspective. And you all are in the front lines of that. How, when you're looking at things to improve our great product, can we incorporate best practices? Can we incorporate ideas from other products, from other areas of the world, as we look to do this? I believe we have a great product. I believe we have the best farmers and buying points and shelling plants in the world. But how do we align the actions that we all take to create value and to reward the right actions that will allow us to support our customers going into the future? Thank you.
Thank you, Carl. That's a, a really nice perspective across the whole industry. So sure to generate some questions there. I have a few.